you have your Bibles, you can open them up to the book of Daniel. I want to talk about a topic tonight. It pertains to deliverance. It is not a well-understood topic. Um, it is one of those topics that within the ranks of charismatic Christianity has become a bit of a shibboleth, but it's not well understood. And it's one of those things that because it's a shibboleth, people think because they say the word, they understand it. But being able to say the word does not mean you understand it. It means you can say the word. And there's a lot of things in life that are like that. They become kind of shop-worn, and they fall into common usage, but people aren't quite exactly sure what we mean by that, and as a result, we become, we become imprecise about what we are saying and what we are not saying. And so that term that I want to talk about tonight is generational iniquity. And I want to say, before I say anything further, generational iniquity is not generational curses although there could be generational curses. I'm not saying those don't exist. I'm saying that people have kind of fallen into saying, oh, it's a generational curse. But labeling it doesn't mean you understand it, and it most particularly does not mean that you know how to fix it. And so I want to talk about this issue of generational iniquity to which generational curses may attach. Does that make sense? I'm letting it sink in for a moment. And if we get clearer about our language and our understanding of it, then our results get a lot better. Because like the stuff we see on TV, you know, those laser-guided bombs and munitions that, you know, they go in the window. <laughs> and then the building just vanishes. That's the kind of targeted ministry that we're looking for. And that's what I want to talk about as it pertains to this matter of generational iniquity. So in Daniel chapter 9... Starting in verse 1, it says, In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, by descent a Mede who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, perceived in the books the number of years that according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet must pass before the end of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. And then I turned my face to the Lord God, seeking him by prayer, and pleas for mercy with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. Verse 13, as it is written in the law of Moses, all this calamity has come upon us, yet we have not entreated the favor of the Lord our God, turning from our iniquities and gaining insight by your truth. Verse 16, O Lord, according to all your righteous acts, let your anger and your wrath turn away from your city Jerusalem, your holy hill, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people have become a byword among all who are around us. Now, Daniel is praying, he tells us, in the first year of Darius. Very few people know what that means. But the Bible actually gives us dates of when things happen. Because true prophetic experiences prophetic words, they can be measured, they can be dated, they can be time-stamped, if you want to say it that way, but there's a, there's a specificity to them. They're not this sort of just vague, kind of rolling around stuff. Now, most people wouldn't know Darius. They may have vaguely remember the name from reading the Bible, but one of the problems people often have with the Bible is the timelines are not clear because the books are out of order. Sometimes the chapters within the books are out of order. Jeremiah talks about how he gave his prophetic word to Jehoiakim the king, and while he was reading, the king took a pen knife and began cutting the scroll and throwing it into the fire, which means it had to be completely rewritten, and apparently when it was reassembled from whatever notes Jeremiah had, things got out of order. It was a tense time in Jerusalem. You had this little problem called a siege going on. And so to understand, for example, the book of Jeremiah well, you actually need to reorder some of the chapters because the way they are in the Bible isn't the way they got prophesied sequentially. Daniel has this same problem, by the way. Chapter 10 precedes chapter 9 chronologically, but in terms of the scripture itself, 9 precedes 10. And unless you know who's king before who's king, you wouldn't be able to sort that out. So... To bring some clarity here, the first year of Darius was the year 522 B.C. 
And it says he was a Mede. But he was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. Well, again, what's a Mede, what's a Chaldean? I have no idea, is what most people would say. The Chaldeans were the people from whom the empire of Babylon arose. And if you've read the book of Daniel or you know any biblical history or you went to Sunday school a long time ago when people taught these things in Sunday school, you would know that there was a time that came when in one night the kingdom of Babylon vanished. It was during the reign of Belshazzar, the son of Nebuchadnezzar, whose name most Christians do recognize. And as he was feasting and drinking from the golden vessels that had been taken out of the temple during the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 BC, a finger appeared, a hand appeared out of thin air and wrote on the wall, your kingdom has been measured and found wanting and has been divided to the Medes and the Persians. And that very night, the kingdom fell because the Mede and Persian army burrowed under the city wall of Babylon. And while the king and his thousand nobles were getting drunk using the goblets out of the temple of the Lord, the hammer fell and they were all destroyed. And now the Medo-Persian empire came to the fore. That's the backstory. Now, long before any of that happened, Daniel, as a young man with three of his friends and a bunch of others, had been taken away into captivity because at that time, in that earlier time, Babylon had reduced the kingdom of Judah to a vassal state, meaning they kind of owned them, they were a satellite, and Judah kind of paid them tribute, and whatever they were told to do, that's what they did. And so Daniel has now been in captivity for a long time because Nebuchadnezzar's reign has come and gone. Belshazzar has come and gone. Cyrus, the, the first Persian king, the one who defeated Babylon, he has come and gone. And now we're to Darius, the grandson of Cyrus, and it's the year 522. And we know that because it's in the first year of Darius's reign, Daniel got a revelation. He says he perceived in the books. There's a lot of ways to get prophetic revelation. The one people talk about the least these days is read the Bible. <laughs> and so Daniel says, I was reading the scroll of Jeremiah, which already they knew it was scripture. And I was reading in the scroll of Jeremiah and I perceived that it had to be 70 years until the desolations of Jerusalem ended. And because it's already 522 BC and Jerusalem fell in 586 BC, you can do the math. We have 22 plus 14 years that have gone by, right? 586, count it backward. Sorry, I'm doing it wrong. 586 down to 522. You've got to count backward when you're in the BC period. So 586 minus 522 gets you to 64 years. How many years is it until they're going to get sprung out of jail? Six years to go. And Daniel gets a revelation. And he realizes, wow, God's going to set us free, but we're not ready to be free. How does he know this? Because he's a high-ranking official within the Persian Empire as he had been in the Babylonian Empire. God has strategically placed Daniel so that he gets all the information, the news feed that's coming in about what's going on. And it may even be that as a Jewish exile, he has oversight of the Jewish community that's living, for example, by the Kabar River where Ezekiel had been living. He might have known Ezekiel. But anyway, Daniel understands this. And so he says, because I understood that a big event was coming. Now, Think for a second here. Everybody's preparing for a revival, right? Hello? Yes. A big event is coming. Maybe what Daniel saw is something we need to see too. Because Daniel was preparing for the big revival, the big return. We get to go home. We don't have to live under Babylonian rule. And he says, in order to get ready for that, I turned my face to the Lord and I began to seek him with prayer and pleas for mercy with sat fasting and sackcloth and ashes. I don't think revival comes just because we sing about it and talk about it. I think it's because we have extended seasons of fasting and prayer. We, we may even think about putting on sackcloth or putting ash on our head. I don't know. It depends on whether you think that's religious or whatever. But in Jewish language, this is a serious and earnest, heartfelt thing that Daniel is doing. And when he prays, he says, I, did, I skipped this verse, but I'm going to read it now. Verse 8, to us, O Lord, belongs open shame to our kings and our princes and our fathers. 
So our rulers and all of our common people, and he talks about our fathers. Now today we would say fathers and mothers, so Jews in those days were fairly patriarchal, but just understand, this is the sins of our nation. This is our forefathers and foremothers, we could say today. Because we have sinned against you. And to the Lord our God belongs mercy and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him. Now, he's using two important words, which I'm going to expand for you in a bit. But he's talking about sinning and rebelling. Sinning and rebelling. These are not the two, these are not the same thing. They're related, they're similar, but they're not the same thing. And he says, we've rebelled against him and we've not, not obeyed his voice. When he spoke, we blew it off. That's important too, because that's where our nation is today. And what we're going to do tonight is talk about something that affects every one of us individually, but it has a corporate-wide matter for what we're contending for as well as a people who are looking for God to move. He goes on, as it is written in the law of Moses, all this calamity has come upon us, and yet we've not entreated the favor of our Lord, our God. In other words, we're really dumb, Lord. You know, the, 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 the axe has fallen. We're in exile, and we're learning to speak Babylonian. We're learning to worship Babylonian gods. We're eating Babylonian food. We've got all these problems, and notwithstanding that, we still haven't sought your face. We just sort of come along, get along, grit your teeth, and get used to it. And so that's where we are, Lord. And we've not entreated your favor. Watch this, turning from our iniquities and gaining insight from your truth. Now, we said a moment ago we have sinning, rebelling, and now we have not instead of a verb, we have a noun, but this idea of iniquities. Three different concepts embedded in Daniel's praying. Three concepts, sin, rebellion, and iniquity. They're not the same. They don't sound the same. And for a lot of people, our thinking is fuzzy. We're going to get it really clear and sharp tonight. <clears throat> and so he goes on and he says in verse 16, according to all your righteous acts, let your anger and your wrath turn away from your city, Jerusalem. I don't know what you're going to do with that verse, just that piece of it, if you think God is always in a good mood. I mean, I, I do get the idea very clearly that when we are in Christ, there is no condemnation, and we are now on the favor side of God, and he loves us, and he desires to bless and extend us. But what happens when, like the people of Israel, we have sin, rebellion, and iniquity, which are not all the same thing, and I'll take them all apart in a minute, but when we have those things in our lives that directly interfere with the blessing of God, and then we say God's in a good mood, and, and he's kind of going, I love you, but you're out of compliance with the way I would have you to live. I know this is a hard thing to hear because so many people have heard that other one that, you know, nothing. I mean, there are some people out there teaching that after you're saved, you can't even sin. Really? 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, written to Christians, by the way. He is faithful and just to forgive us all unrighteousness. What do we need that verse for if you can't even sin after you've been born again? So you can see that our thinking has become fuzzy and unclear in part because we are not biblically sound and grounded on these very important concepts. He says, let your anger and your wrath turn away from your city, Jerusalem. What's he praying towards? the restoration of the holy city, which was destroyed in 586, and we're 66 years downrange from that, 64, and he's, he's waiting now for six years later. He knows what's going to come. I don't know. Maybe he prayed for six years, but he's praying into the thing that God has shown him out of the book of Jeremiah, and he's saying, oh, God, there is wrath against the city of Jerusalem. By the way, the one that it says God places his favor on Jerusalem, and yet God has this issue to contend with a city that had been filled with violence and iniquity. He calls it your holy hill. Why? Because our sins, wait a minute, how is this going to be our sins? I mean, we've been in captivity for 64 years. None of these people in Babylon, a lot of them were born in Babylon. They've never even seen Jerusalem. If they're old like Daniel, they were there as a youth, but they haven't seen it in a long time because of our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers. 
You see the linkage here that he's building. We'll talk about it more in a minute. Jerusalem and your people have become a byword among all who are around us. People look at us and they go, you're the people of God who would want to be one of the people of God. There's no blessing on that. Look at you. You're all in bondage. You're all living in Babylon or now Persia. It's awesome. If that's what it is, I don't want anything about it. And so the people of God in this era of Daniel's praying have become, as he says, a byword, a, a laughing stock. What are you going to do with that? Well, Daniel prays this prayer, and it's 522 B.C., and there's something of what Daniel prays that releases something we could say in the heavens, I believe in that kind of thing, but there's a very concrete, tangible result on the earth. Turn with me to the book of Haggai, chapter 1. In the second year of Darius. When did Daniel pray, anybody? First year of Darius. Something's about to happen in the second year of Darius. How much time's gone by? About a year. And he tells us in exactly when it happens, on the sixth month, which is one Elul on the Hebrew calendar, it's basically the boundary between August and September, and it's the year 520 B.C. now. I know I said 522 before, but you're, you, know, you know how years work. It doesn't, December 25 to December 25 is exactly one year, but if you extend a little bit more, suddenly you're in January, and it's still the second year after the first December 25. Are you with me? Okay, so it's actually 520 B.C. when this happens. In the sixth month, on the first day of the month, guess what happens? The word of the Lord comes to Haggai the prophet. Daniel prays, and more than a 1,000 miles away, it's like this is the terrain of the Holy Land or the Middle East. Daniel's over here in Susa in the, in the citadel, the capital of the, of the Persian Empire. He prays, his prayers ascend, they bank shot off of heaven, and they descend on Jerusalem, and wham, the word of the Lord comes to Haggai the prophet, and Haggai says, and, and by the way, we'll just unpack that a bit, comes to Haggai the prophet, to who? Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel. Who is that? He's the secular governor. He might be the governor. Think of your governor. Yeah. He's the one who has the political power and also to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak. Who's that one? He's the high priest. So God lights up the government and the church system at the same time while Daniel the slave is praying this prayer. And the word of the Lord comes, thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. And when they say that, then the word of the Lord comes again. Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house of mine lies in ruins? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You've sown much and harvested little. You eat but never have enough. You drink but never have your fill. You clothe yourselves but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them in a bag with holes. So the, the, the word is provoking. We've been told no one can give provocative prophetic words. But this is a legit prophetic word from somebody who was good enough to make it into Scripture, even if he only had two chapters. So we're kind of re reframing the boundaries around prophetic ministry in this, aren't we? But the, the thing I want you to focus on is that Daniel prays, and it causes a release and an ignition of a prophetic ministry called Haggai. And Haggai speaks both to, we call him the Jewish Pope, if you want. He's the high priest. But I, I just want you to have clearly in your mind, this is the highest ranking Jewish um, religious official, as well as the highest ranking political official. And the word is, you haven't rebuilt my house, even though 16 years before, there had been a group of them allowed to return because of Cyrus's decree, the first Persian king, the one who defeated the Babylonians, he had issued a decree saying, go home and build. But when they got there, they were discouraged. They had opposition from the people around them in the land who were pagans, and they they just laid it all down, but instead what they got busy doing was feathering their own nest. They built nice houses, and guess what? They used paneling even in those days, just like we use it today. 
Maybe today we, at the time right now, 2019, maybe people are a little more inclined towards fancy paint and wallpaper. But I remember paneling when I was a boy. You guys remember paneling? Back in the time, that was the thing. So these people are busy kind of getting a good existence, living there in the, the, the life that they were given to lead, and they're saying, yeah, you know, look at all that. Here we are. It's a nice Mediterranean climate, and, you know, we got good wine that we're growing, and we can catch fish out of the sea, and we don't have to live at least directly under that whole Persian Babylonian thing. And so they've kind of gotten a little bit self-satisfied. All that gets stirred up because of Daniel's prayer. And it's not just his praying. It's very specific praying. It's that praying that addresses the sin, rebellion, and iniquity. At the same time that Haggai gets raised up, so also is raised up Zechariah. Now, Zechariah, he has his own interests and concerns. Haggai gives a very personal prophetic word to Zerubbabel, Zechariah gives a very personal prophetic word to the high priest Joshua. So they each had somewhat different spheres or metrons of authority, but they, they ministered as a prophetic tandem. This is all happening because Daniel prayed in a particular way. So I'm showing you, before I tell you what I really want to tell you, why this matters. I'm showing you the why. Because I want you to care a lot and I want you to get after this with a great hunger because we can live the same way. These things were written down as examples for us upon whom the ends of the ages have come. All right, let's go back now. So Daniel prays this way. You saw the effect of his prayers. Now let's go back a little further in the Old Testament, and let's look first at the book of Ezra, and we're going to look at the book of Ezra chapter 9. Now Ezra comes along approximately in this same era that all this is going on, And I'm not going to read all the backstory, even though it's fascinating. I mean, I, I love to preach on these post-exilic books because, you know, all of them, Daniel, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, Ezra, Nehemiah, this is the linking of history and prophecy. And all of them tell us the prophetic history of Israel, and all of them have templates that we can use in the now for a time of restoration, a time of revival or reformation. And these books are rich and thick with all of that. But unfortunately, today, we don't preach these books, and so I think we don't really have clarity around the template. But, okay, Ezra comes back a little bit after all of the events that we've described, and Ezra is a direct lineal descendant of the high priest. In fact, early in the book, it gives his genealogy. It goes straight back to Aaron, and as it's laying it out, it says, this Ezra came back to Jerusalem, lest there be any doubt which one we mean. And when Ezra gets to the Holy Land, one of the things he finds is that things are not in order among the people. Not only had they built paneled houses, not only were they enjoying the fine Mediterranean climate, getting suntans and enjoying you know, the wine and the seafood and all that, but as it turns out, they had intermarried with foreign women. I mean, everybody knows... An accent is something that pulls at the heartstrings. And this is true for men and women. That's why, you know, it's always dangerous to send your young person to Europe on a vacation. They might fall in love with someone named Jacques. <laughs> or, or Jacqueline. <laughs> why did God not want them to intermarry with these foreign peoples? Because they were pagans and they worshiped other gods. And the Lord knew that if they did it, they would end up likely going after those other gods rather than lose peace in the home. Because very few people, when the chips are down, will put God ahead of their human relationships. So God just said, don't marry any of them. And Ezra comes back and it says um, that the people had, here, I'll just read it. In Ezra 9.1, after these things had been done, the officials approached me and they said, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites, the religious leaders themselves, have not separated themselves from the peoples of the lands with their abominations, meaning their idols and their particularly their sexual practices. From the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. 
For they have taken some of their daughters to be wives for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy race has mixed itself with the peoples of the lands. And in this, the faithlessness of the hand of the officials and the chief men has been foremost. In fact, we find out later on that none other than Joshua the high priest has allowed his son to marry into this, and there have been children born of that. What's that going to do? Dilute the high priestly line and cause compromise within pure and undefiled Jewish religion. This is what's happening in America with Christianity. Most of the mainline churches in America today are, I think, beyond repair. It's not that God doesn't love them, but... If I started telling you the things that are going on in the mainstream churches in America, that's actually why God is raising up new river stream churches like this one. Because those other ones are so bad. And it's all this intermingling with all these foreign gods. But I get off my topic and we'll never get to the real stuff. I better shut up and keep going. So as soon as I heard this, I tore my garment and my cloak and I pulled hair from my head and beard and I sat down appalled. And here's how he prayed, verse 6, Oh my God, I am ashamed, and I blush to lift my face to you, my God, for our iniquities, there's that word again, have risen higher than our heads, and our guilt has mounted up to the heavens. From the days of our fathers to this day, we have been in great guilt, and for our iniquities, we, our kings, and our priests, have been given into the hand of the kings of the lands, to the sword, to captivity, and to plundering, and to utter shame as it is today. And but now, for a brief moment, favor has been shown by the Lord our God to leave us a remnant and give us a secure hold within this holy place that our God may brighten our eyes and grant us a little reviving in our slavery, for we are slaves. This is the church today. We live in captivity and bondage. We are held by the hand of the enemy. And we have things in our lives, whether they be sicknesses, neuroses, maladies, whatever, and we're bound. And, and, and we, we don't even know how to get out of them. And what Ezra is saying is, you, give, you showed us the grace to let us come back, and we went right back to the original stuff that got us here to begin with. Oh, God, have we learned nothing. That's what he's praying. Sometime after Ezra's... <clears throat> entreaty to the Lord, sometime after Ezra, a man named Nehemiah returns. Now, this is some years later, several decades later. But Nehemiah comes to rebuild the wall. They've got the temple finally built, but Jerusalem is an unwalled city and therefore subject to invasion and pillaging and whatnot, and they need walls, so Nehemiah comes to build them. But when Nehemiah gets to, the, to um, the Holy Land in order to do this. It says, Nehemiah chapter 9, again, I don't know what it is about these chapter 9s, but we looked at Daniel 9, Ezra 9, now we're in Nehemiah 9. Nehemiah 9, 1, now on the 24th day of this month, the people of Israel were assembled with fasting and in sackcloth and with earth on their heads. And the Israelites separated themselves from all the foreigners and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. They owned what they had done, and they owned what their fathers had done. <clears throat> so they do all of that, and then verse 16, but they and our fathers acted presumptuously and stiffened their necks and did not obey your commandments. They refused to obey and were not mindful of the wonders that you performed among them. But they stiffened their neck and appointed a leader to return to their slavery in Egypt. But you are a God ready to forgive, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And you did not forsake them. Well, Nehemiah summoned the people to fast and pray and confess their father's iniquities. And in all of these three stories that we've looked at, and we aren't even in the main passage yet. This is all runway. And I have to preach long on a message like this to lay the backstory because in general people don't understand how this stuff all fits together. And you will lose the power of the message and the drama of the story if you don't understand how it all fits together. So Daniel prays, we get the beginnings of a revival in Israel that include the raising up of two prophetic voices, Haggai and Zechariah. Then Ezra comes just a little bit later, and he prays again, and then later yet, Nehemiah comes, and the one thing that all three of these men have in common is they pray confessing sin and iniquity, and also transgression. So where did these guys get these strange ideas? Why would you pray and confess the sins of your fathers? 
This is completely out of our minds in America. You know, what our fathers did is what our fathers did. And, you know, maybe we need to say we're sorry to the, you know, people who were offended or hurt by what we did. But the idea that we might actually have some business to do with God is completely foreign to all of us. So where did these guys get these ideas? Well, in the Ten Commandments, no less than the Ten Commandments, I know it's old school to preach the Ten Commandments, lest we appear to be legalists. <laughs> Exodus chapter 20, and again in Deuteronomy chapter 5, it says this in Deut uh, Exodus 4, you shall not make for yourselves a carved or old-fashioned English graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the waters under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them for, now the word for here, you could substitute the word because. Because the Lord your God, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. In American English, we don't have a good use of the word jealous. It's always a negative term, and yet God is holy, and by definition, anything that pertains to him is okay and right. So when we hear that God is jealous, it immediately we go, cognitive dissonance. What do you mean God's holy and good, but he's jealous? Because he doesn't want us straying and going after other things. And we could go right into the heart of the marriage covenant with that too, but we'll just leave it there. And because I am a jealous God, I visit the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. But I show steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Now this is right in the Ten Commandments, and God is telling us something about his nature. He visits the iniquity of the fathers and mothers on children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren down to through the generations. So how does that me mechanism work? Well, before we answer that question, later on, Moses has this encounter with God. Most people would remember something of this story. He is leading the children of Israel out of Egypt. They're in the desert. Moses goes up on the mountain, and he prays to God, and he says, if I've found favor in your sight, show me your ways. Moses wants to know something of the ways of God. How does God think? How does God do things? And he says, if you show me those things, I will follow them that I may gain more favor in your sight. And he, then he says, if your presence doesn't go with us, don't lead us up from here. Because how will anybody know that we have favor if you don't go with us. How will anybody know that we have the real mojo when it comes to religion if the presence of God and the favor of God is not exhibited among us and upon our ministries and our doings? People will just think we're just another religious option and it's your word against mine. That's what Moses is saying. And so the Lord says, verse 17, I'm in Exodus 33. Exodus 33, 17, the Lord says, what you have asked, I will do. This very thing that you have spoken, I will do, for you have found favor in your sight. And Moses says, all right, show me your glory. And God says, all right, I'll show you my glory, Moses. I will cause all of my goodness to pass before you, and I will proclaim before you my name. That's how you're going to see my glory. You will see my goodness, and you will hear me myself proclaim my name. That's what I'm going to do to answer your prayer to see my glory, right? Right? And so for chapter 34, Moses goes up on the mountain. God hides him in the cleft of the rock. He says, I'm going to put my hand over you because you cannot see my face and live. But as I pass by, you will see my back and I will proclaim my name in front of you and you will see my glory. Now watch this. This is, this is deep revelation and by the way, the rabbis agree with it. I love it. It's good Jewish exegesis as well as Christian exegesis. Verse 6, the Lord passed before him and proclaimed his name. Here it is, the name of God. If you like Yahweh, Yahweh, say that one. If you prefer to be a good Jew in, in form, say Hashem, Hashem. The name, the name. 
or in our English Bibles, the Lord, the Lord. But he said, this is who I am, Hashem, Hashem, a God merciful and gracious and slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. We like that part of his name, right? It sounds like God's in a good mood and favors upon you and he's going to bless you and all that. Keeping steadfast love for thousands, we could say in brackets, it's not in the text, but thousands of those who love me. It's the same language that we saw in the Ten Commandments. To a thousand generations, God will be faithful to those who walk with him and keep his ways. Are we all together? Keeping steadfast love to a thousand generations and forgiving, watch this, iniquity, transgression, and sin. We're going to talk about all three terms more in a minute, but God's got an answer for all three. Most Christians think iniquity, transgression, and sin are cognate words for the same thing. It's like saying, I don't know, some of you might resent this, but Coke and Pepsi are both cola drinks, right? And Royal Crown, if they're still in existence. I don't know if they are, but okay. So we think sin, iniquity, and transgression are all the same thing, just said different ways. Nothing could be further from the truth. And if you don't understand the difference, you will miss the power of what's happening here. And I'm going to unpack it for you, so don't worry. So for those that are on my side, I forgive iniquity, transgression, and sin, but, but I will not clear the guilty. There's no free pass out of this thing. And by the way, what does God show Moses as he pulls his hand away as he goes by? He sees his back. He sees that there's a humanoid form, and what Moses is seeing prophetically in this vision that he's having, this visitation, it's more than a vision, is he sees the pre-incarnate Jesus, but he sees the back, and God is saying, this is my answer to this problem of iniquity, transgression, and sin. Moses, I'm letting you in on the biggest secret in the universe because right now it's 1446 BC and Jesus isn't going to be on the scene for almost a millennium and a half. That's what's going on. The answer to the problem is found in Jesus, as if that should be a surprise. But God's giving him a revelation. But wait, it goes on. I will not clear the guilty. This is the name of God. I will not clear the guilty. Oh, you can call him loving and merciful and Hashem and, you know, blow the shofar. You can do all of it, but his name is also, I do not clear the guilty. If you are guilty, you are not cleared until you are cleared. This is part of his nature. This is part of the revelation of God that we have lost because we have become, I don't know, imprecise <clears throat> in our thinking. And here's the other part of his name. I visit the iniquity of the fathers on the children and to the grandchildren to the third and fourth generation. Father, child, grandchild, great-grandchild, great-great-grandchild. That's your fourth generation. My name is, I visit iniquity on all of them all the way down to the third and fourth generation unless the blood of Jesus is in play. That's heavy. That's a side of God we don't think very much about. It's really uncomfortable. Nobody wants to preach it, but it's right there. And Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. And he said, if I have now found favor in your sight, O Lord, please let the Lord go in the midst of us. Remember, that had been his prayer in chapter 33. For it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for your inheritance. This is where these guys, Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, got these weird ideas about praying over the iniquity that was in the people of Israel that had landed them in captivity. It's right there in the Decalogue. It's right there in the Ten Commandments. It's right there in the Torah, and it's in the most fundamental revelation of the nature of God that we have. Oh. That's not the God I thought we were serving. But this is why we have to preach the whole counsel of Scripture in order to understand who he is. Now, all of these events that we just talked about with Moses, as I said, the Exodus was in the year 1446 B.C. 
they'd been in the desert a little while, so maybe the clock had run down a bit, but it's, it's that era. And around the year 1000 BC, so approximately 400 years after all of this revelation had been given, there was a king who came to power named David. You might have heard of him. And David had a little bit of a problem called Bathsheba. And he had another problem called her husband, Uriah the Hittite. And David committed adultery, and he ends up killing Uriah with the sword of the Ammonites by putting him into the front line, and he gets cut down in battle. And we all know Psalm 51. We'll look at it in a minute. But David had written a psalm about all of this. A couple of summers ago, I was, you know, doing my Bible study, my devotions, and I, you know, I was following one of those outlines that, you know, today you read these scriptures, and tomorrow you read these scriptures, and you kind of go along, and anyone who's ever followed one of those, it's a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing because it keeps you going, and you have a systematic way of reading the Bible, and I've read through the Bible, all of it, about 52 times, and I've read parts of it four or 500 times, depends on which parts we're talking about. So I'm, I'm, I mean, I know the Bible fairly well, but I'm, I'm following this plan. So I, you know, each year I'd use a different one and I'm following this plan and I get to Psalm 32 and the Lord says to me, stop right there. I want to show you something. So I read through Psalm 32 and I'm paying attention. And I take some notes and the next day comes and I'm ready to go to Psalm 33 for that part of my devotional plan. And the Lord goes, go back to Psalm 32. And I'm like, well, Lord, but you don't understand. i got to keep up with the Bible plan. And he says, I want to show you something. Slow down. All right, so we go back to Psalm 32, and I learned some more. And the next day, I'm thinking, okay, i got to read Psalm 33, and now i got to read 34 because i got to catch up. So I'm ready to do that, and the Lord goes, go back to Psalm 32. And I'm like, hey, wait a minute. I'm falling behind here. And so he and I have this thing going for about four days, five days. And presently, the Lord says, do you want to learn what I have to show you, or do you want to follow your stupid plan? <laughs> so I put the plan aside, and for six weeks, God took me through Psalm 32. So I read the Jewish commentaries. I read it in Hebrew. I read it in the Greek translation. I read it in several English translations. I read a bunch of commentaries by Christian authors as part of all that, but mostly what I did was I went through the entire Bible chasing down all the threads that are tied to Psalm 32 and the deep revelation that's in it, and I want to share with you a few nuggets out of that time of exploration. So Psalm 32 says, blessed is the one who's, watch this, transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered, blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity. Hmm, three words that we saw in Exodus, right? Okay, we're going to come back and unpack them. Blessed is that one who transgression, sin, and iniquity respectively have been dealt with. We'll just say that. And in whose spirit there is no deceit. Uh, so it's more than just those three things. For when I was silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me and my strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Selah. What does that mean? Stop and consider. Meditate on it. Chew on it a bit. So I actually had two whole days where I just meditated on verses 3 and 4. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away. Huh. Osteoarthritis, anybody? Bone disease of other kinds. Oh. And it seems to be tied to this. We'll get better. Don't worry. I'm just teasing you a bit. And day and night, the hand of God was heavy upon me. Now, there is a, a phrasing in the Old Testament of the hand of the Lord came on the prophet, and when that happens, it's for prophecy. But this one isn't for prophecy. This one's like chastisement. Day and night, your hand was heavy upon me, and my strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Somebody say chronic fatigue syndrome. Oh, really? Yeah. Selah. Let it sink in. Chew on this like a cow with its cud. Let's keep going. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Selah. 
He's giving the answer to the problem. But when we read it, it sounds all tangled up and you know, most of us just kind of blow through this like skimming the tops of the waves. And this is more like XO, take her down, set your depth to 100 fathoms, right? We need to go deep on this. We'll come back to it. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters, they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. Selah, a third point to stop and ponder. Now David switches. I will teach you. I will instruct you what you should do and the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. First and foremost, do not be like a horse or a mule who have no understanding, which must be curbed with bit and bridle, or it will not stay near you. Now, if you've ever worked with mules and horses, they can be kind of ornery. And the only way to make them heed is you put that bit in their mouth, and you, know, you pull on it, and it hurts, so they'll begrudgingly go with it. David says, don't fight this one. Yield to it. Lean into it. Embrace what I am telling you because I am telling you truth. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous. Shout for joy, all you upright in heart. That's the end of the psalm. So <clears throat> in Hebrew, this is really fun. In verse 1, it's talking about Transgression, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven. The word in Hebrew is pesha, and it says who, whose transgression is forgiven. The Hebrew word is nasa. It rhymes in Hebrew. It doesn't work in English, but pesha nasa. You hear it? Pesha nasa. It's designed to be something you can kind of feel the linkage and the, it's almost like, it's like when you're skiing and you're, you know, slaloming down the hill. Transgression and forgiven. Now, this word pesha, which is translated transgression, means revolt or rebellion. You might remember I was highlighting that when we were back in the Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah time. Uh, revolt, rebellion, offense, falling away, breaking away, apostasy. But the key point here is transgression is the willful offense against the ways of God, knowing you're doing wrong or choosing not to do the right you should do, and you know darn well what you're doing. This is what David did when he slept with Bathsheba and then killed Uriah. That is Pesha. It's transgression. It's, it's revolt and rebellion. And it goes on in Christian circles too. Well, you know, I knew I shouldn't have done that. Stole from my employer. Slept with my girlfriend. You name it, whatever it is. But it's wrong, and you know it's wrong. Or you know there's something you should be doing. God's spoken to you about it, and you said, well, it's not that big of a deal. In God's eyes, it is. Are we all together? I know this is a little bit of a longer message, but I just don't know how to say all this without making this thorough. Are we okay? Okay. What's the answer to it? Nasa, to lift up and carry away and to uh, support forgiveness. That's what the word nasa means. You know where it says, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows? In Isaiah 53, he nasad, same word. So there's something of that when transgression is present, it needs to be lifted up and carried away and set aside, if you want to say it that way. Then the next thing he says, whose sin is covered. Again, we have a little bit of poetry here. The word is chata, and it means the statutes of God. And the way you deal with it is you cover it, or kaka. So chata, chaka. If you don't speak Hebrew, it doesn't mean much. And no, this isn't kaka like your kids like to talk about. <laughs> so in this one, this word sin, it's not the same as transgression. Transgression is the knowing uh, violation of what God commands or the knowing omission of what God has told you to do. This one, this sin, this is a violation of divine law and it's offense and culpability, but it has to do with things that you didn't actually know that they were wrong at the time you did them. But they're still wrong. Many years ago when I was in John Wimber's church, my wife and I had a home group and one night we got a phone call 
no one had cell phones in these days or we would have had a text. But we got this phone call from this couple that was in our home group and we knew they were getting friendly and it looked like a romance was budding and they wanted to come over and talk to us and we figured they were going to come and tell us they wanted to get married and you know all that. So they show up and they're looking really like down and kind of sheepish and bummed out. So we said, well, what's wrong? And they said, well, um, you know, we're, we're, we're in love and we think we want to get married. Yeah, well, so, you know, we started making out and, and I thought, I know where this is going. And they said, but, you know, we stopped. And I thought, oh, good. And they said, and we decided to look up in the Bible to see if it was okay to have sex. And we couldn't find anywhere that said you couldn't do it, so we went ahead and did it. But as soon as we did it, we felt really grieved in our hearts. I said, didn't you read the verses about fornication and adultery? Oh, is that what those words mean? Ah, ha, ha, you didn't know. But you see, your heart bore witness within you anyway. And so on this one, many times people do things they do not know are wrong. Remember my story last night of the woman eating the meat in Taiwan? She didn't know it was wrong. After all, the church said it was okay. Still didn't make it okay. Are you following me? So now we're in a different category. One is knowing, one is unknowing. Let's keep going. He says, blessed is the man or woman against whom the Lord counts no iniquity. Now here it doesn't rhyme. The word is avon. And it's, he says the Lord doesn't count it against him or doesn't impute it against him. The word in Hebrew is yachasab. It doesn't sound like avon. So the poetry is breaking down on this one. But iniquity here means perversity or depravity. It means bentness or twistedness or boldness or pervertedness. But it's the idea of an arrow's shaft. And if an arrow, nowadays we make arrows out of aluminum. But if you had an arrow's shaft in the old days, you made them out of trees, and you looked long and hard to find good tree wood that would be straight. This is one of the reasons, by the way, in the Middle Ages, the English could not be conquered, because yew trees grew wild in the English countryside, and yew makes the best bows, and it it comes out straight when you make arrow shafts. So they became the most feared archers in Europe because their arrows would fly farther and hit harder because of the U. But if you have a crooked arrow and you put it in the bow and you fire it, it goes this way. And the problem with iniquity is when it's in your bloodline, it will cause you to be corrupted and bent. And the good that you want to do, you cannot do because it pulls you off of center and you find yourself fighting this thing and you go, why am I not able to get free of this thing? Yeah. And so David says, blessed is the man or woman against whom the Lord does not count their iniquity and in whose spirit is no deceit. So we have three problems as human beings and all of these pertain to deliverance because demons like to attach to sin or transgression or iniquity. And sometimes when we're trying to drive them out of people, they don't seem to come out. We've kind of covered the waterfront of every single thing we can think about and lo and behold, there's iniquity going on that hasn't been dealt with and the demons will happily attach to iniquity as well as to the sin and transgression that you yourself may be guilty of. How do you get iniquity? Your father's and mother's sins become your iniquity. They pass in the bloodline. This is exactly what happens with the sin of Adam and Eve who ate the fruit of the tree and it passed into the, all of the generations of Adam is what it says in Romans. And we have a similar problem. Your mother and father or grandmother and grandfather may well have been involved in something whether or not they knew it was wrong, and now it's been passed into the blood, and without ever knowing it, you inherited it, and now it's become a bondage in you. See how that works? So David is talking about this threefold cord that is not quickly broken, to quote another scripture. But he gives the remedy. The good news is this doesn't have to be all bad. We just got to diagnose clearly before we solve the problem. So here's his answer Part one is found in, well, so hold on. So when I kept silent, my bones wasted away, and we talked about that through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as the heat of summer. So what happens when sin or transgression or iniquity haven't been dealt with, 
then you may actually have these things that are upon you and they begin to suck you dry, to use a very colloquial term from modern English. So here's the solution that David gives. Number one, I acknowledge my sin to you. Now this word acknowledge means to know it or perceive it or come to an understanding to admit it and confess it. The Hebrew word is yada. And this again is related to things that were not necessarily known. So as you become aware of things that were not okay, now you want to take that on board and deal with it. Part two, he says, I did not cover my iniquity. Well, the word, uh, the word not to cover is related to the word kafar, which means to wipe away, and it means not to conceal it or hide it. Now, this is a really important one because a lot of times, and some of you will know exactly what I'm talking about, families have secrets, and they don't want to talk about that one. I remember... When I was a kid, my grandmother used to tell me about Uncle Merlin, which right there you should have known something's wrong. <laughs> but she would tell me, don't go near Uncle Merlin. Just stay away from him. She never told me why. You could guess. Maybe he was a pedophile. Maybe he was an axe murderer. I don't know. But don't go near Merlin. I remember my mother telling me about Uncle Merlin, and she would tell me, the story of one day she and her identical twin sister were walking down the road. They lived in rural Michigan to the one-room schoolhouse. Those things did exist once upon a time in America. And as they were going down the road, Merlin came up behind them in a vehicle and was following them closely, and they became frightened, and they ran into the cornfield, and he chased them into the cornfield, but they escaped from Uncle Merlin. Well, that reinforces the concept that he might have been a pedophile, although I don't actually know that he was, in fairness to him. But what I did know was my grandma had said, Merlin is a no-fly zone. Beware of him. So Merlin was one of those family secrets. And I never did fully find out what the secret was. But most families have those secrets. You know, your grandfather did time in the state penitentiary. Your mother had a couple of lovers that she brought into the home. And, you know, all this went on. Or, you know, there was this, you're, you're, I remember praying for one guy who had an incurable thing in his life. No one could figure it out. And he told me, you know, my grandfather ran a still during Prohibition, and he killed an internal revenue. And I said, there's blood guilt on your house, and we have to clear the blood guilt. And as soon as we did, bang, he got healed of this thing that he'd had for years. Because it was iniquity in his blood that had been, in that case, the transgression of his grandfather. See how that works when you get the language clear? Are we all together? Some of you look shocked. Some of you look angry. Some of you are just confused. Are we all good? Okay, let's keep going. We've got to end this sometime. And then David says, I'm not going to cover my iniquity. So when it comes to that, one of the things you have to do is pull the skeletons out of the closet. And in families, one of the most common, but not the only one, is incest. And let's be clear. I cover this in the Grace Law and Freedom material, not this uh, iniquity stuff, but, but this business of incest. What is incest? Many people think incest, and I'm only mentioning it because it's so commonplace and everybody will get what I'm talking about. I could use other examples. But with incest, many people think incest is, you know, the act of penetration. Can I say that? That's not too lurid. So they, they leave it there, but that's actually not right. In Hebrew, the concept of sex is to uncover the nakedness of another. Now, if you have children and you had to diaper them and bathe them, you're not incesting them. It's with the idea that any form of arousal is going on. And it doesn't have to be full arousal. It could just be, you know the stirring, they say, in your loins. You know what that is. Men and women both know it. They experience it differently. But when arousal is happening because of nakedness, so if... And in, in the book of Leviticus, it specifically says, among other things, you may not look on the nakedness of your sister or your brother. Grandfathers may not sleep with their grandchildren. You can't sleep with a woman and her daughter. There's all these different things that go on, but all of them are rooted around this idea of uncovering nakedness. So if you, somewhere in your past, saw or were seen, hello, this is going both directions. Watch this or you'll miss it. 
if you saw or were seen the nakedness of a body and there was some degree of arousal around it, you were incested. And when that happened, it became an open gateway. Spirits will attach to that. So when people need to get free of certain things, we have to deal with the spirit of incest that is attached to whether it's sin or transgression or maybe iniquity because it can happen upriver and it comes down in the generations. Does that make sense to everybody? Now, I do not want a show of hands. Repeat, do not want a show of hands. But I do want you to stop for a moment and think about maybe in your childhood, that uncle, that cousin, your brother or your sister, playing house, lying on top of each other, maybe taking a look. I've, built, I've prayed for many people where one woman I prayed for, her father had taken a drill and drilled a hole in the wall of the shower, and when she would shower, he would look through the hole at her. Hey, it's pervy. I know it's pervy. She was being incested, even though he didn't touch her. Now, of course, it can get worse. They, touching can occur, and even more than that can occur. We don't need to belabor it, and I don't want to start teaching on that. But, but I do want you to grab this idea of what it looks like. And a lot of times, that is not uncovered, and so it remains iniquity that is not cleaned out or wiped out, and as a result, people remain in bondage to things that they don't even know, because they say, well, nothing happened. It felt a little weird, but eh. But that weird thing that you feel, what that is, is the spiritual contamination of the incest. By the way, it doesn't have to be incest. It could have been that boy or girl that you had a relationship with when you were way back in high school. We all know what goes on, so we don't need to elaborate on it. You say, yeah, but we didn't go all the way. doesn't matter. You uncovered the nakedness because that person touched you in an area that was reserved for your spouse. And now you got this thing going on inside of you, and you know it because every now and then it comes to the surface, maybe when you're making love with your spouse, or it bothers you in the night, or worse, maybe spirits visit you in the night, but you've never wanted to talk about it because you don't even have language for it, and you're concerned everybody will think you're crazy. Does that make sense? Some of you are nodding, so I know I'm hitting the mark with this. So we can't let iniquity remain covered. It's got to be uncovered in order that the blood of Jesus that Moses saw in his time on the mountain can be brought to this thing in order to wipe it out. And with that, the demonic bondage that's tied to it can get blown out the door. Third part of this is also in verse 5. David says, you forgave, uh, sorry, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. So I acknowledge my sin. I do not cover my iniquity, and I make open confession of my transgressions. Why do I confess my transgressions? Because I knew darn well what I was doing when I did it. Or I failed to do what God told me to do, and I actually need to make some, some adjustment with my lips. These three words are the very words we saw in Daniel, Ezra, Ezra and Nehemiah, and David says at the end of it, Selah, and here's what happened when I did that. You forgave the iniquity of my sin because my iniquity powers my sin. It drives me into behaviors and attitudes that I should not have, and it gives it force and strength, and that gets cut off when it gets put under the blood, but it's got to be done in an explicit way. This is not one and done. I confessed my sins when I came to Jesus, and it was all taken care of. Because we're, this is actually meant to be a deliverance-focused message, but I'm teaching you something of the mechanics of the spirit world of sin, transgression, iniquity, and of deliverance. Does that make sense? Okay, we're getting closer to the end. <laughs> and so with this third one, as we confess, we deal with our revolt and our rebellion and our waywardness. So let's take it from the top. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven and whose sin is covered. How does one come to blessedness? First of all, what is blessedness? It's living under the shalom of God. It's living in wholeness. It's living in cleanliness, purity, strength. We could call it divine health if you wanted to call it that. You know, it's always dangerous when preachers use themselves as examples. But my doctor always says to me, I have no patients your age who are not on at least five pills, and most of them are on 10. 
And he says, I don't know what you're doing, but keep doing it because you're not on anything. And he goes, when we run your blood tests, your cholesterol could be a little lower, but I like red meat. <laughs> your cholesterol could be a little lower, but other than that, your blood pressure's great, your heart is strong, you have absolutely nothing wrong. Every single thing we measure in your blood comes in right in the middle of the range. It might be that I was blessed with good health, but I think it's also that I've taken all this to heart over the years and been aggressive in going after my sin, my transgression, and the iniquity of my fathers and mothers. So the blessed life, the happy life, the prosperous, fruitful life arises by dealing with these things, and so with that, all three categories are addressed, verses 3 and 4. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. So when I kept silent, when I closed my mouth, when I didn't deal with all of this stuff, I became, let's just say as a summary statement, spiritually, emotionally, and physically limited. I became vapid. My life went sideways, and prosperity of soul and body could not come to me. Financial prosperity might elude me as well, but right now I'm talking more about these other factors. Does that make sense to everybody? And David gives, as I pointed out before, a couple of specific examples. Bone conditions arise from this, and so does something like chronic fatigue. And it doesn't need to be only chronic fatigue. It can be just that kind of enervation that, that comes to you. Then he goes on and he says... In verses 5 and 6, I acknowledged my sin to you. I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. You disemboweled my iniquity. You robbed it of its power. Therefore, as a result of that, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters, they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. Selah. So he says... Let everybody acknowledge, again, and that acknowledgement base is based on knowing or perception. You could even say it's a revelation of what was wrong and you didn't know it, but you've got to come to terms with the specific sins. This kind of peanut butter praying, oh God, forgive me for everything I've ever done wrong, that's not going to work for this one. We're going deeper here. This is the kind of freedom that we see in Acts chapter 19 where they bring all the amulets and magic books and they burn them and Paul has a deliverance revival that breaks open the entire city of Ephesus because they're getting, and you know who would have known this is Paul, right? He's a Hebrew rabbi. Okay, so um, I'm not going to cover or conceal or hide my iniquity, and I'm going to deal with the root of sin, the rebellion and the revolt and the offense. offense. This deals with our lukewarmness. <clears throat> and so all of that together releases the iniquity of sin. It disempowers it. And then he says this, an interesting statement. Pray while you can. Now, it's not that your prayers can't work when the chips are down and the rising flood of waters is rushing around you which is all the language out of verse 6. It's that when the chips are down, when your children are rebelling, when your husband or wife is leaving you or molesting the children, when you're finding out that you've got some weird disease that no one can cure and all this stuff is coming up like kudzu, you're in a panic and you can hardly focus and center enough to say, oh God, I really need to get thorough here and you may not even have time to do it. So what David is saying is take care of business now. Don't wait until things go bad. You can take care of it now, and you can live the blessed life. That's what David is saying. Because in the time of trial, the prayers won't reach God. Again, not that they cannot. It's just that you'll be in such a panic, you won't be praying well, if you want to say it that way. But when iniquity is handled in particular, now remember, iniquity is what comes to you from your forefathers and mothers, transgression and sin are what you are responsible for. But when that all gets dealt with, guess what? God becomes a hiding place. He becomes a stronghold for us, and we just shout the hallelujah, I've been delivered. I don't carry what my parents or grandparents carried. I remember I've done a lot of ministry to Freemasonry through the years, a lot of it. In fact, when I was here for ISDM, 
we had a ministry time over delivering over uh, Freemasonry, and there was at least a hundred people that got up, and man, it just went off. And I'd done a lot of this ministry, and I was I would looked at my own life. I mean, I'm very proactive about this. I'm not telling you anything I haven't done for me. And I, I every time I would go, God, I know there has to be there has to be Freemasonry in my line. Because I knew what the indicators were, and I'm like, it's got to be there. But I talked to both sides of my family, everybody that was alive. I said, is there any Freemasonry? No Freemasons in our family? Nope. No one in our family is a Freemason. Nope. We would never do that stuff. And I'm like, I'm telling you, it's got to be there. But I couldn't figure it out. And I just kept it before the Lord in prayer. And I kept saying, Lord, I'm sure it's got to be there. Please forgive my ancestors for doing this. I, I, I don't know where it is, but it's got to be somewhere. Well, around a year ago... Uh, two years ago, I went over to my aunt's house, and she gives me this book, and it was written by a cousin I've never met. And you know how people give you a book, and you just kind of flip through a couple pages just to see how's it written, are the chapter titles interesting, do I want to read this book? And so I'm reading through it's the history of my family, and I'm flip, I just flip open to this page, and right there in the middle of the right page, it says, my great-great-grandfather, that's Gen 4, my great-great-grandfather gave a silver trowel to the mayor of New York, and it was used to lay the foundation of one of the major monument buildings on 9th Street in New York City, and that building stands to this day. And the silver trowel is on exhibit in the New York Historical Society. Now, I know a lot about Freemasonry, and as soon as I saw that, I went, contact, range to target, 1.2 kilometers, target acquisition, fire. Why? Because at the highest levels of Freemasonry, beyond the 33rd degree, Freemasons give silver trowels one to another. And I went, there it is. If you're serious about this, God will uncover things that cannot be uncovered because he will know that you really want to go after it in a time when you're at peace. And so you know what I did? I thought, I'm going to check this out. So I went over to the New York Historical Society Paid the fee to get in, and I went around, looked at the exhibits. They were interesting, but I was looking for one specific thing, and I found the case, and there was a silver trowel. And when I saw it, Masonic symbols all over it. And I'm like, that's it. Well, Annette Houck, the blonde woman that's on our team and is in back praying for people right now, she was one of the people that was with me. I took a small team with me, and I said, right here, right now, we're going after this thing. So they prayed for me, and I did a little bit of manifesting in the New York Historical Society, but I got delivered to my Freemasonry. It had been there all along. And by the way, let that be a lesson to all of you. Some people say, I can't minister to this until I'm free of it. Sure you can, but your confidence may be lower. I didn't actually know I had it. I just suspected it strongly, so I just kept dealing with Freemasonry left and right. But I wanted to be sure that I was sure, so I called a friend overseas who does a lot of work with Freemasonry, and I got another round of prayer with him and my daughter, and then things started to shift in my world that hadn't been shifting. I was living overall a pretty good life, pretty blessed life, but things got even better because the curse of the Freemasons on me was broken because that iniquity that had been lying there quietly in the root had been dealt with. Does that make sense? Okay, now we're getting a lot closer to the end. So pray while you can. Do it now. Now is the day of salvation. Then it goes on and says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. And I talked about this bit of how horses and mules can be a little bit ornery and, and strong of will. But it says God commits to lead us and counsel us as the apple of his eye. But he does want willing vessels. So if there's something of this that is, you know, something in you is rising up going, I don't like this. You know, this is bondage. I don't want to deal with that stuff. And I already confessed it all. If you got that going on, there's a problem. We just want people to be willing to address the things that God wants addressed. Then David goes on. He says this, verse 10. Many are the sorrows of the wicked. Now, again, we think of wicked, we hear it, and we go, yeah, those are bad people. They're wicked. Okay, but that's shallow. What is the wicked? A wicked person is a person who is trapped in their iniquity. Iniquity is running in their bloodline, and they haven't addressed it, and it causes that bentness in them. And those who walk bent are by definition wicked, and consequently the saved can be among the wicked, which is a counterintuitive outcome. Because we think, hey, we're the righteousness of Christ, right? We're, we're all good. Well, you're forgiven. For sure you're forgiven. But the iniquity is still at work in you. And you know where you see that in the New Testament? The mystery of lawlessness is already at work. 
And you know where it's going to come to its highest expression? In the Antichrist. That's what it says in the Bible. But that's another sermon too. So those trapped in transgression and sin who still walk in iniquity, it says they inherit sorrow. So when iniquity is at work in your life, there's a lot of sorrow that can come about. Calamity, financial collapse, sicknesses, problems in your family, and on and on it goes. But the steadfast love of the Lord goes on to the thousandth generation of those who trust in him. So you can, you can get out of that condition and into the good, blessed state where the hand of God is upon you, and then refreshing will come. Now, what are some examples of this in the Bible? Well, Psalm 51 is one of our famous ones. Most people know this is the psalm where David confesses his sin of Bathsheba, but let's read this a piece of it, this psalm, with the lenses that we've now developed David says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. What were David's transgressions? Adultery and murder. So he's doing what he counseled in Psalm 32. He wrote Psalm 32 after Psalm 51. He first, he did it, then he theologized it. All right? Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Oh, oh, you got it. Blot out what I did knowing it was wrong. Wash me from the iniquity I'm carrying that I didn't even know was there. And cleanse me from the sin where I was clueless but did it anyway. For I know my transgressions and even my sin is ever before me. And against you I have sinned and done what is wrong. But note this, verse 5, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. Now, in the Catholic Church, they used to teach that this was referring to how original sin gets passed. They used to say the very act of a man and woman coming together was itself wrong. And in the moment of joy, that that was the moment where sin passed from the parents to the child. But that was actually bad theology. If you read the rabbis on this, what he's saying is, I was brought forth in iniquity. I was carrying iniquity when I was brought forth, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Now, the, the Catholic view of this was it was wrong to have sex. But if you understand this lens of sin, transgression, and iniquity, what David is really saying is, my mother did wrong not knowing she did wrong, and here's the deal. David was a redhead. He was the youngest of the sons. When Samuel came to offer the sacrifice at the house of Jesse, they didn't invite him along. At the valley of Elah, his three eldest brothers are like, what are you doing here? Get out of here. You just came to watch the battle. He's clearly the looked down upon, spit upon younger brother, and there is a minority view, not the majority view, but a minority view, and the rabbis support it, that David's father, Jesse, may have had an affair with a woman and David was the fruit of that affair, and this is why he was carrying iniquity that would lead him into the very sin of Bathsheba. That would then get transmitted to Solomon, who would have 300 wives and 700 concubines. Oh, yeah. And so David sees all this, and he says, you delight in truth in the inward being. And so, Lord, I put it all in front of you. My mother, she was one of those. My father, he was one of those. And this is, this is where I came from. But praise God, God could anoint even a man born in adultery and make him king. You could be a king. You could find your inheritance if you deal with this stuff the way David did. That's why this is so powerful. This is, this is the way to wipe out a whole layer of stuff in your life, and it, it becomes the equivalent in the spirit of a nuclear warhead wiping out structures and bondage in your life that you never knew were there. And then he says, verse 9, hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. So he's owning what he did. He's acknowledging what his, what his father and mother did. All right, let's take a look at a couple more, and then we are done. Psalm 103, verse 3. David says this. I apologize for teaching long. Psalm 103, 3, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Number one, he forgives your iniquities, and therefore he heals your diseases. 
the ones that are stuck to your iniquity that wouldn't go away when the iniquity is cleared, the diseases have nothing to hold on to because this one is not a therapeutic healing, it is a Yaomai healing like I taught last night. Wow, bless the Lord. He forgives my iniquity and I find breakthrough in areas that I couldn't find breakthrough. How about this one, Psalm 107. It says this, verse 17, some were fools through their transgressions, their sinful ways, and because of their iniquities, they suffered affliction. Affliction is a word that refers to spirits that cause sickness and illness. We look at that in normal American theological speak, and we say, well, they did wrong, and this is what happened. No, this is that word iniquity. They didn't do anything about it. It just came to them. But there is also this problem with their transgression. So you're not getting off the hook here. We're just correctly targeting which is what. They loathe any kind of food. Somebody say food allergies. Where do they come from? Transgression and iniquity. What are two of the most common sources of that? Somebody went to the temple in India or Thailand when they were on vacation. They transgressed on holy ground, not holy the way we think holy, but dedicated ground to that God. And suddenly they were afflicted in their stomach. Food became loathsome to them. Yeah, because we're not to go in the temples of foreign gods. It says it in the New Testament as well as the Old. Well, but I was just a tourist. I didn't know. Okay, you didn't know. Change it from transgression to sin, but you still got a problem, yeah. right? Yeah. So they may have been involved in a foreign god. They did yoga, and they're having problems with their back now. Why? Because they were worshiping a foreign god when they were doing yoga. Oh, really? Yeah, it's a thing. My parents or grandparents or great-grandparents were Freemasons, and they worshiped the foreign god that is over Freemasonry, and that passed into their bloodline, which became your iniquity, and you're carrying it, and something activated. You had a trigger event, and suddenly that iniquity went active, and suddenly you've got gluten intolerance or chocolate or soybeans or wheat or just fill it in. Why do you think America is exploding with food allergies right now? Because a, two generations ago, pretty much everybody, they may not have been very devout, but they didn't worship gods other than the Lord. Now everybody's like, yeah, worship what you want. I'm a Wiccan, you know, I'm into yoga a little bit, and I go down to the Buddhist temple, and I do my meditation thing, and, you know, I decided to take a look at Reiki, and all of these are foreign gods. You are trafficking in foreign gods. You know what it says in the Bible? If you worship the Lord, your bread bowl will be blessed, but if you worship other gods, it will not be. What's your bread bowl? It's that which feeds you, and suddenly you got food allergies. Remember what I told you about the woman in Taiwan last night? What was she doing? Eating meat sacrificed to idols? She was not blessed. Her food was troublesome to her. So they loathed any kind of food, and they drew near to the gates of death. Sometimes this stuff looks more like irritable bowel syndrome. And they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. Here's what he did. He sent out his word, and Yaomai healed them and delivered them from their destruction. But how did it happen? Transgression and iniquity that were not dealt with. Clear it out, and you're going to see a lot of people getting healed. Does this make sense? Now, I have seen many, 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 many hundreds and thousands of people all over the world getting free of food allergies and other conditions when we start dealing with this, and it's right there in the Word of God. But if you don't have the right lenses on it, you'll just think sin and iniquity are the same thing, and you just gloss over it. Does this make sense? Okay, just about done. Isaiah 53. This is the passage on the, the atonement itself. It deals with Jesus, and it's foreshadowing what would happen with his life. Verse 4, Isaiah 53, 4, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Well, that deals with the inner healing component of his ministry. We aren't talking about that tonight, so I won't say much more, except that grief and sorrow can be healed. He was pierced for our transgressions, and he was crushed for our 
iniquities. These are the two words we just looked at in Psalm 107. And upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. We could have been chastised, but instead he took the chastisement so that we could have peace. And this is not just peace with God. It is peace with God, but it's bigger than that. It's peace in your body. It's peace in your mind. And the Lord has laid on him, here it is, the iniquity of us all. Jesus carried away our iniquity. Psalm 85 says this one. Psalm 85, O Lord, you were favorable to your land. Meaning, you turned your favor back to the land. You blessed it where it had been cursed. You restored its fortunes. And it says, literally, you restored the fortunes of Jacob. And you forgave the iniquity of your people, and you covered all their sin. Selah. This is exactly the language that comes out of David's Psalm 32, only now the sons of Korah have turned it into a hymn. You withdrew all your wrath, and you turned from your hot anger. Restore us again, O God of our salvation, and put away your indignation toward us. There's no way for that to happen but for the blood of Jesus because his name is, I will by no means clear the guilty. And yet, you saw the back of the one who has the ability to do it, and when you bring his blood to it, it can be taken care of. Now, sometimes people say, where is this in the New Testament? It's actually more than you'd suppose, and it's late enough now I don't want to dive too deeply into that pool. Um, but in the, in the Council of Jerusalem in Acts 15, the apostles actually address this when they say these are four things that you have to avoid among the, uh, the Gentile converts. And what they're really doing is following the structure of the moral code of Moses. I, I, by the way, cover all of this in the Grace, Law, and Freedom material. Um, but they're addressing the, uh, the structure of the code of Moses. And what they're really doing is helping the Gentiles who have no language for any of this, which none of you did before I did this message tonight. They are helping them transgre not transgress, transition into a lifestyle where they can move away from all that and get free of it. But in John chapter 9, we have this strange story where it says there was a man born blind, and Jesus healed him. And when he does, just ahead of that, the disciples who have been learning from him, who have been traveling with him, who have been healing with him, they say, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind? Well, it's absurd to think that the man had sinned. He was born blind. And Jesus goes, well, in this case, boys, it's neither one. He was born blind as a one-off, that the glory of God would be seen in him and he would be healed and so on. But note that Jesus does not rebuke that line of thinking. And if you read the commentaries on John 9, all of the you know, Western commentators that don't understand this Hebrew way of thinking about sin, transgression, and iniquity, all of them say pretty much the same thing. Well, you know, in those days... People mistakenly believed that the sins of their ancestors could come and attach to them. And that's why these men were asking that. Well, duh. Why do you think they thought that? Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, Psalm 32, Psalm 51, Psalm 85, Psalm 103, Psalm 107. We, they had really good reason to believe that. They weren't just benighted fools, but, you know, today we know better. and Because we have cell phones and nuclear power and the Internet. So there's this arrogant pride that keeps us from seeing that. But note, Jesus does not rebuke it. What does that tell you? In his healing training with his disciples, he was teaching them to look for and discern the iniquitous roots of problems in people's lives. Not that every single disease is anchored to this. Let me be really clear about that. Because otherwise, all of you are going to go home and start introspecting. What do I have down there? Oh, my gosh. Uh, I wonder if my grandfather, you know, all that. But this is the one you deal with, this iniquity. When nothing else is working, you go, there's got to be something here. We need to take a deeper cut. That's when you transition to the iniquity. First, deal with sin and transgression, because that's in the now generation with the person you're dealing with. But when nothing else is working, back it up and maybe take a look. What's going on in your family history? Now, I'm going to end with a story. You're going to love this story. I was in Houston uh, two years ago this month, 
And I went to this um, church that was filled with people from Venezuela. And we did the whole service in Spanish. And ministry time came. I had a small team with me. And we started praying for people. And in that Hispanic church, because they are not like we are in middle-class America, they marry a lot younger than we do. And it's not at all uncommon for people to marry at age 15 or 16. In fact, within the Hispanic communities, they have a really big celebration for the women called quinceañeros, quinceañeros, 15 years. Well, at 15, you can get married. Now, some of us go, that's child abuse, and yeah, but in some of these societies in the world, they don't see things the way we do. I don't know if we're right or they're right, but I'm just telling you that's what they do. And so they marry people off, and what that means is if you just do the math, you can stack up five generations by the time people are 75 or 80 years old. Right? See how that works? Well, so here we are in this church, and I, they bring all these people to me, and there's one family in this church. It's the whole family tree is intact. They have great-great-grandma up there. The other three great-greats are gone, but great-great-grandma's there. All the great-grandparents are alive. All the grandparents are alive. All the parents are alive. All the children are here. So it's a, it's a pretty big family tree, but for me, I like science. And this is like the perfect laboratory experiment of the very things I've just been teaching you. So I pray for great-great-grandma, and then I pray for all the great-grandparents, and now I'm down to the grandparents. And, you know, this was, by the way, a ministry time that took about six hours. But anyway, <laughs> we're on Latin time, so it's all right. So I pray through all this stuff, and I get down here to Generation 4, and I'm about to start praying for the baseline Gen 5, but I'm going across the, the tree with these people, and I run into this guy. They bring him to me. And as soon as he's walking toward me, I go, there's something wrong with this guy. I can tell. You know, sometimes you can just tell. And so I'm starting to talk with him and interview him a little bit, and somebody leans over and whispers in my ear, he's autistic. And I went, huh. And I thought, let's see, this guy is the son of these people up here in Gen 3, and they're descended from those people. Now, I've already cleared everything up above, so we've been dealing with sin, transgression, and iniquity. And I, I'm just thinking about it. Okay, that one, there was bestiality. And there, they had homosexuality. And there was unclean conception through sex before marriage on that one. And over here, we had a divorce which led to adultery uh, through the remarriage process. And, we, and so I'm looking at all these things, and I thought, all right, we've dealt with all that, but we're just going to go one more cut. So we dealt with each one in the family tree, every iniquitous root that we could find. And then I laid my hands on this guy, and, you know, he was a little bit twisted, and he couldn't quite talk right. Now, please, no one get upset. I'm not mocking. I'm just simply trying to demonstrate the nature of the healing, okay? I have a handicapped child myself with whom we are busy taking all these things to heart and trying to push it forward. But anyway, so he, you know, kind of not quite right. And I laid my hands on him, having dealt with particularly the iniquity. And as I did, all of a sudden his face just sort of straightened out and his voice became normal and he was done. Yeah. I don't think it's the only thing that's going on with autism, but one of the reasons autism is exploding in our Western societies is two generations ago, our grandparents, or maybe our parents, depends on your age, but in the 1960s, the sexual revolution got kicked off and a completely new order of things came into being. In the 1960s, your typical woman who came to the altar was a virgin. And most men were as well. 90% of women who were getting married in America in the 1960s, according to the best data we have, were virgins on their wedding night. 10% were not. And 70% of men were virgins. 30% were not. By the way, the average number of partners per woman was three. And the math works. Because if 70% of men are clean, 30% are not, they got to be with somebody they were with those 10% of women, and three partners get you to the 30%. That's how the math works. It ticks and ties. The most recent data that we're able to gather is from a couple of years ago, 2016. 
Today, 95% of men and 95% of women come to the altar not as virgins. One in 20 will be a virgin, the other 19 out of 20 will not, and the average number of partners has risen to 10. In addition to that, that's on both sides, men and women. In addition to that, abortion has become commonplace, and people think certain kinds of alternative sexualities are okay. All of that leads to iniquitous roots. Well, we're reaping all that now from what started two generations back, but what we did without knowing it was when we overthrew, I'll say 1,500 years, but maybe it's closer to 1,800 years, of Christian morality, of what marriage is, we brought something upon the whole of Western civilization, and with that, we are destroying ourselves, and autism is one, not only, but one of the fruits that has arisen because of all this iniquity that's been released into the generations, and it's growing like kudzu in America today. And that, my friends, is why we must teach our children and ourselves, because some of us here may be guilty of this, to live clean and pure lives before the Lord. The only valid expression of sexuality is a man and a woman in marriage for life. Period. Full stop. Carriage return. But see, we don't teach that anymore. Well, you have needs, and God knows, and he loves you anyway, and on and on it goes. So we're starting to see... Oh, you know, overcoming victory over things like autism as we take this iniquity thing to heart, we start dealing with it. We're seeing victory over food allergies as we take this iniquity thing to heart. We're seeing victory over things like weird generational sicknesses that haven't even been diagnosed as we take the iniquity to heart. And it's as simple as just saying, what are the family secrets that you carry? and starting to work through those, through the disciplines that you already know, inner healing and, and deliverance, and being sure to apply the blood specifically to those things that need to be uncovered so that the demonic enforcers that are creating all that woe and misery in people's lives can be slain and laid low in the dirt. And then the power of God breaks through. I've talked long enough. I will stop here. Thank you for listening. Amen.